fed up with the everyday grind, tired out from the summer heat, want to get away from it all. We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are caught in a web of nightmare, struggling to free yourself from sleep, while constantly, threateningly, your destruction draws closer, and you know unless you awake, the ultimate conclusion is death. Tonight, we escape to 2200 A.D. and the fearsome picture of the last days of civilization, as H.G. Wells told it in his terrifying story, Dream of Armageddon. From the very beginning, the dream was quite vivid and real much more real than the dull world of business that moves by day. And in a short time, I began to thrust the waking world aside and live my life wholly in the dream, night by night. I was not then aware, of course, of the, of the hideous ending to come, a thing so horrible to face that even though I doze now in my chair, I dare not sleep. I can't recall exactly when the dream, if it is a dream, first began. Oh, a month ago, perhaps. At any rate, I fell asleep in my flat and awoke in another place and another time. That is to say, as I fell asleep here, I awoke there, far away on an island in the Mediterranean and hundreds of years in the future. Heaton. Heaton, you must wake up now. Wake up? But I... Where, where am I? Here with me, of course. Oh, Eden, my dear, you've been dreaming. Oh, yes. Yes, I, I remember now. It was, it was such a vivid dream. I, I thought I was a man living hundreds of years ago. Silly, but it took me a moment to shake it off. And was I there with you? In the dream, I mean? <laughs> You're here with me now. That, that's the important thing. Has there been no word? No, nothing has changed. Nothing. Otherwise, I should have awakened you. Good. Perhaps they've finally decided to leave us alone. I hope so. I couldn't stand much more of it. Our faces on every telescreen all over the world. Scandal criers saying things. It doesn't about... matter, Noma. It's over. We've left all that behind us in the north. We're going to be very happy here. Oh, my darling, we have to be. It's the only thing that will justify what you did. Noma, can you doubt that we will? Come here. Look out through the glass wall there. Blue sea down below us, pale hills in the far-off mainland. Why, is there any more perfect place to be happy than here in Capri? And what of the woman you brought with you? Did you not perhaps give up too much for her? Pay too great a price? You're worth more than all of it, Noma. You make me feel very humble. You were the most powerful man on earth, council master of the allied nations of the north, the ruler of a billion people. A billion fools? Why, had they not been, they would have accepted you. They, they felt they had reasons. Reasons? Could not permit me to marry beneath my station now. I've given my whole life to them until now. Has a man no right to happiness, Noma? They follow their own desires. Why shouldn't I do the same for once? Why not, indeed? I've no answer for you, beloved. I'm proud and humble for what you did. But also a little afraid. Afraid of what? I don't know, Heaton, I don't know, but I... The Visitor. Mm. Your pardon, Master Heaton. May I have your attention, please? Yes. Yes, go ahead. What is it? There is one here who desires to speak with you. I'll see no one. I've told you that. He tells me to say the white grasses grow tall in the north and reach above the snow. Heaton, it's a messenger from the council. Yes. Very well, send him up. What does it mean? Have they thought of some new no, way? No, to... no. 
No, my darling, it is nothing. You'll talk of duty again and all the other things, the same kind of talk. It can't be anything else. If only they'd chosen someone besides Eversham to govern. But they did choose him. If he doesn't suit them, they can find someone else. I'll have no part of it. He's such a fool, such a stupid, blundering fool. Well, perhaps they need a fool. Perhaps that's why... Oh, there's the messenger. Come in. I must beg you to pardon this intrusion, Master Heathen, but the council considers the matter of the greatest importance. It's all right. Now, what is it you wish? Uh, if we, uh, we could speak alone, perhaps... I have no secrets from the lady. She knows everything. Now, what is it? I am empowered by the council to ask you to return at once and take charge of the government again. Alone? Uh... Yes, yes, that would be required, of course. Then the council wastes my time and theirs. But there have been new developments. Eversham already has begun the moves we've always feared he would. Now, no one but you can stop this madness, this foolish ambition of his. And more is the pity, for I do not choose to do anything about it. You know what it means, of course. I know nothing of the affairs of government. I am a private citizen engaged in seeking happiness. Master Heaton, do you believe that one man can work out his fate apart and separate from the fate of all mankind. You may leave now. You may go back and tell the council that I have no concern in their problems now or ever. Very well, Master Heaton. But if you should decide differently, d d decide quickly, for there is very little time. Oh, Heaton, is it true? Will it really come to that? Probably the south and the east are not easily bluffed. But war. Losing the world again for the first time in a hundred years. War again. They don't know what it is. No, they don't. They've never seen it. Eden, you can't let it happen. No, more, my darling, I've made a choice and it's final. If it comes to war and the whole world falls in ruins, then I'll live on in the ruins. But I'll live there with you. That's final. Eden, I'm afraid. I calmed her fears at last with many brave prophecies of the joys we should find in our life together. And as we talked and watched the sun sink finally in the waters of the quiet sea, the blusterings of Eversham seemed far away and the threat of war no more than a part of some nightmare. At a late hour, we fell asleep. Henry. Mm -hmm. Henry, wake up. Right, I... I said wake up. <sighs> Can't see why you always have to wait for me to shut off that clock. Oh, sorry, dear. I was dreaming. Dreaming, indeed. Now get yourself dressed. You want to be late again this week? Good chance of war. I, I don't oh, know just what I can do about it. I... Oh, Henry, for pity's sake. There's one thing certain. I won't give her up, no matter what happens. Her? I... Who's her? Oh, uh... Yes, yes, of course. I'm getting up right this minute. I'll get dressed right away. Henry, now, I... Now, there's no need to get excited, dear. There's plenty of time to catch the 712. I never saw such a man in my life. Wasn't for me telling you what to do, I don't know what would become of you. All that day at my office, I kept thinking about the dream. It was hard to remember that it had been a dream. It had been so real. As real as everyday things going on around me. Perhaps even more real. <laughs> Certainly more desirable. For, uh, as you may have guessed, my daily life held little of interest. But in the dream, oh, in the dream, everything was different. There I could be the great master Heaton, controlling the destinies of millions of people, feeling for the first time in my life a... A deep and exhilarating sense of power, so sharp in its contrast with the drab, waking life I lead. And most of all, most of all, I could not forget the girl, the way she looked, the glorious way that she... Well, no matter. All day I kept wondering if I should be able to find the place again so far away in space and time. Too long delayed, the night came at last, and I went to bed, hopefully. But nothing happened. There was no dream. For three nights, there was no dream, and I, I grew frantic with worry, with longing for her. 
And then came the fourth night. Careful, darling. Watch where you're going. You almost fell over those rocks. I, I'm sorry. I, I guess I was thinking of something else. Yes, for three days now. You haven't been yourself at all. Well, it's... Well, there are, there are so many things to, to think about. It's all right, Eden. I've known you were thinking of it constantly, even though you've not mentioned it. There's nothing new, is there? What? I mean, well, have you had any word that you've kept from me? Thought it best to? Something of that sort? No, he didn't know. I, I've had no word from the North. Oh. No one here has, yet everyone seems to sense it. There's a fever in the air, a tenseness, as though they could smell something. The smell of war, perhaps. There'll be no war. Once Servisham knows his bluff's been called, he'll back down. You know him better than that. You'll count on that blind luck of his to see him through. And you could stop him, Heaton. You could still go There'll back. There'll be no going back. How can we hope to find happiness for ourselves if millions die because of us? If it should start, it can't last long. People in the world today have no idea what war is. When they find out, they'll have no part of it. When they find out, it'll be too late. There'll be blood on the ground then, and hate and vengeance... And there can be no stopping it. Then why should not... Well, then the fools shouldn't... They shouldn't start it then. But they are fools. You said yourself. Mm-hmm. What? Look. Oh, planes. Some special pleasure flight from the north, I suppose. Eden, they... They don't look like transport. They, they're not built the same. They're, no. They're like pictures no, of the right. old... Those are war planes. Those are bombers. It's begun already. No. No, but it's part of the bluff and a dangerous part. Uh, those planes have been stored away for a hundred years. I, I knew of them, of course. All the council did, but... But I never thought I'd see them in the air. I fear it's a wrong, terrible thing we've done. And I'm afraid. But it would be a lie, my beloved, if I said I was sorry. <laughs> No more warplanes came to Capri in the next two days. But the sight and the sound of the first ones had been enough. The peaceful island of pleasure became a beehive of belligerent activity. Preparation for war by a people who had never known anything but peace. Old weapons, relics for years, came out of storage places, were cleaned, polished, made ready. Big guns appeared as if by magic were quickly set in placements about the rocky isle. Norma and I took no part in the madness about us, but walked alone from the others. She with a growing sadness, and I with a swelling hatred for blind, blundering Evesham, and for the stupidity he'd called forth now in mankind. And then, late afternoon of the third day. But why? Why do they act as if they might come here, Heaton? If there were a war, it could never reach to Capri. Who knows why they act or what they think? There's no reasoning in them. They're like sheep, anxious to get their throats cut and have it over with. It was all so beautiful, so beautiful, Heaton. Oh, no, 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 it still is. All this has nothing to do with us. We've turned our backs on it. What they do now is their own concern. This can't touch us. It's so terrible to think about it. Even look, the planes have come back. Yes. Coming over the hills there. He's still playing the same old game. Oh, how long can that blundering Eversham hope to... Alma. Alma, these are not the same ones. What do you mean? I know the shape of these. These are war planes. War planes from the south. Then, oh, no... Oh, no, it, it can't mean anything. Was that what they call a bomb? That was what they call war. War. Eden, I want to see it. All oh, its no, horror no, and idiocy. No. I want to see it. Not too close to the window, Norma. Look, down there by the edge of the water, where the little pavilion was, Eden. There's nothing but broken rocks and smoke drifting up. Yes, yes, that's where the first bomb went. But why should they wish to destroy a little summer pavilion? An accident. They were trying there for the docks. We swam there every morning. Do you remember how clear and how clean the water was? There must be blood in it now. Norma, Norma, there's no good in that kind of thinking. This is what they chose. Now they've got it. They couldn't have known it would be like this. Perhaps not, but that can't be helped now. It's too late now for them ever to turn back. How could they ever? Eden! Eden, Norma! Norma, Norma, get back! Look, Eden, that plane along the beach... Oh, promenade. 
hundreds of people and children to I I don't want to see any more, not ever. We've got to find some way to get out of here. Some way. Some way. Capri is right in the middle of it. It was so beautiful here. Why should anyone make war on Capri? Why? War has a bad habit of spreading everywhere once it's turned loose. Just a moment. Supervisor from 22. I'd like a private plane and a pilot right away. A destination to be decided. Sorry, sir. All planes have been taken over by the government. General order by Master Eversham. Confound it. All right. What about a boat? Power boats have been taken over. Perhaps a few small sailing craft may be still available. Find out. Get me a navigator and enough crewmen. Sorry, sir. The government has ordered all able-bodied... All people. right, all right. Just get me a boat, then. Buy it, charter it, whatever's necessary. I'll sail it myself. Yes, sir. Where can we go, Eden? I don't know. I don't know anywhere but yes. here. Yes, oh, yes, and let's go quickly. Take me away someplace, Eden, far away. Anywhere but here. <laughs> Then flight. Days of flight from stolid death in his military boots who tramped always just behind us. Never far away. I fought to stay asleep. To stay with my dream. To stay with Noma. I cursed each time I awoke. I simply can't understand you, Henry. You moon around the house like a lovesick calf. Haven't been to the office in three days. Don't you have any consideration for your job or for me? Do you want to see us kicked out into the street like tramps without a cent to our name? My waking life became the vague movement of shadow figures of which I remember nothing now. But my life in the dream was very real. Oh, yes, very real. No, uh, no, no. I've just come from there. You cannot go through the past. Why can't we? is impossible. You must go back to the coast quickly. Even can't you explain to him we must find some place to buy food? We've had nothing to eat for two days. L no, lady. There is no food here. Everyone is starving. Pestilence has broken out. Pestilence? Horrible plague. Came suddenly. Already, people of two villages are lying dead in the gutters. It's spreading very quickly. Come. Come, Norma. Let's go back to the boat. tried first to land somewhere along the southern shore of the Mediterranean. We found it everywhere the same. In some places, the people were dying of disease and starvation. In others, they were dying of bleeding burns from the flame of war. But always, always, they would die. Oh, Eden, everywhere we go, we find dead. Dead bodies. More and more all the time. What's happening? Has the whole world gone mad? Is the whole world dying? Back again to the north and a landing on the peninsula. Then pushing our way overland, trying to find some haven in a world intent on smashing itself to bloody fragments. Fleeing from the idiot fury around us and being blocked, blocked at every turn. You cannot go there. You must turn back immediately. Why? Why must we turn back when there's no place left to go back to? Back where? That I cannot tell you. But if you go farther, you will die. They have used poison gas. The area is contaminated over hundreds of miles. I've seen people die from it. It is not a pretty sight. Death everywhere. Of course, uh, if you would like to stay here, I'm sure we can take care of that pretty little throat of yours. Yes, yes, indeed, we can. There were no real battle lines as yet. No armies. The thing had come too fast. But everywhere roving bands fought, plundered, killed one another. Sometimes not even knowing if they were killing friend or foe. And always, always overhead were the planes, hunting like hawks, killing anything that moved. Eden, do you think he sees us? I'm not sure, Norma. Don't move. Don't move. He's heading toward us, all right. Eden, we can't just lie Don't here. move, Norma. By heaven, I think it is us. Look. Where? That old woman walking on the road. Doesn't she know? Oh, oh Ethan, horrible. Horrible. No, my no. 
Let's go. It wasn't us he was after. And so for love and for reason, on and on, day after day, we fled from the monster stupidity of war. Until at last we could flee no farther. We found ourselves at dawn one morning in an open space near those great ruined temples at Paistum. Roman ruins that have stood for centuries were still standing even then. We sat and watched the sunrise, the most beautiful I've ever seen. We said little to one another. Low hills broke away below us, dotted here and there by trees, low thickets of laurel between. The great stones of the temples above us were pale pink in the morning sun. And the silence was everywhere. Silence and a false feeling of peace. This morning, looking out there, one would never know. Oh, it's beautiful. But we, we can't stop here no more. We're only hours away from it now. How much farther, Heaton? How far must we run now? I don't know, my dear. It, it, it seems to be everywhere. Sometimes these last few nights, I've looked up at the stars and I thought, all of this is happening because of us. We're to blame for it, you no, know. No, no, darling. No, we... We tried to find happiness, that's all. Can there be anything evil in that? I don't know, Keaton, but I'm afraid. Had you not run away with me, this would not have happened. And millions of people must die for our happiness. Something is wrong. Well, the blame lies with them. They, they die for their own stupidity. We are not stupid. We could have prevented it. Had you gone back and left no, me... No, 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 my darling. Now, there'll be no talk of that kind. We'll still find... We will... The, the chance to work things out somewhere. I, I have a strange feeling, Eden, we shan't have any more chances. We owe some kind of a debt. They're going to have to pay for it very soon. Oh, you're tired, Norma. That's why you talk this way. You'll soon Look, feel... Look, Eden, another flight of planes. Yes. Yes, they're everywhere now. <laughs> like vultures hovering, watching and waiting every... Norma. Norma, we'll find some place yet. Some place... Norma... Norma, get down! Norma. No. Norma. Norma, you all right? He and I... I love... Uh... Norma. Norma! I sat there on the ground for hours, holding her body close. I, w I was only dimly aware that she was... that she no longer lived. Time had no meaning. The world receded far away. The shadows of afternoon pointed all one way, and my thoughts were only... only dreams within a dream. I must have stared at them for several minutes, not realizing who they were, watching them approach through the bushes. Before they came within yards, before it struck me suddenly, those uniforms. They were soldiers of the South and the East. With only one thought in mind, I jumped to my feet and ran toward them. No, no, it, it, it's all right. It's all right. You, you don't need those guns. I mean no harm. Neither do I. You see, I only wanted you not to, not to come here. It's my wife. She's she's dead. There's no one else here. Duck. Nay, back. No. No, put away the bayonet. There's no need for it. You can take your men around the other... No, what... What are you going to do? Duck. She right. No! Oh. 
I lay there on the ground for a long time after they left. At first I tried to crawl back to her. But I couldn't. Then later I was unconscious. Whether this be Armageddon, that last flaming end of the world, I do not know. But of this I am sure, when the end does come, it shall come through man's unheeding selfishness, through man's stupidity. For when man stood up and learned to think and was no longer an animal, he became one with the gods, and like the gods must take heed of the fate of mankind. This I know. Always before, I had longed desperately to escape into the dream. But now, now with equal desperation, I fear to do so. For Hedon's world is dying now, shuddering in the last great convulsions of its death agony. Over the whole great landscape of Earth lie the rotting, disfigured bodies of the dead. The sad sun gleams with a pale and ghastly light through the smothering curtain formed by the hideous fumes of war. The moans of the half-dead swell up from the plains of earth, fill the vast emptiness of the heavens, and go unanswered. Starvation, pestilence, war and death. The whole world is dying. <laughs> Eden, too, is dead. He died hours before I awoke this morning. His body still lies before the silent temples at Paistum. Yet in the dream, I still occupied his body. After he was dead, great vultures came and tore with their beaks and claws, and I was, I was still conscious. I was still conscious. Now tonight, tonight because of that, though I grow faint with weariness, I dare not go to sleep. In the name of heaven, how long will a dream go on? Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Tonight we have brought you Dream of Armageddon by H.G. Wells, adapted for radio by Les Crutchfield, with editorial supervision by John Dunkel. Featured in tonight's story were Stacey Harris and Betty Lou Gerson, with Charlotte Lawrence, Jack Crucian, Eric Rolfe, and John Daner. Special music by Ivan Dittmars. Next week... You are standing in the light of an arc lamp by the cathedral in Mexico City, looking at a dead body lying at your feet, and a great fear comes over you as you wonder if you are a haunted man. <laughs> Next week, we escape with Ralph Bates' most unusual story, The Haunted Man. Good night, then, until this same time next week, when once again we offer you Escape. Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>